22nd of June, 1921. The royal yacht, the Victoria and Albert, steams into Belfast. King George V is greeted by loyal Protestants in the six counties of Northern Ireland. Although under the authority of the Westminster government, Northern Ireland had its own parliament. The king was here to open it. Across a decade of trouble, whilst Catholic Ireland had fought for independence, Protestants here had striven to remain within the United Kingdom. In an independent Ireland, these Protestants would have been a minority in a profoundly Catholic country, where the church wielded great influence. They saw United Ireland as a place where the Roman Catholic Church would influence the decisions of the state, and this was something they were totally opposed to. They wanted a place where they could practice their own religion without interference from the Roman Catholic Church. They didn't see this developing in the new state of the 26 counties, and therefore were opposed to it. And I think that it's true to say that what existed then, this attitude of mind, still exists today in the minds of the Protestants. But Catholics in Northern Ireland, a third of the population, did not welcome the king and the British connection he symbolised. To them, the partition of Ireland was unacceptable. So hostile were they that there were fears for the king's safety. Indeed, as he drove through the Belfast streets, there were scuffles in the crowds. Like their compatriots in the south, they had wanted an end to British rule and a united republic of all Ireland. But now, they were anxious for their position as a minority within the new Protestant province. The northern state wasn't created out of thin air. They knew the background of the people who were going to control the state. Uh, Belfast throughout the 19th century had been notorious for uh, anti-Catholic riots and for discrimination. Belfast Corporation had been fairly notorious for discrimination against Catholics. Uh, so they expected the new regime or anticipated that the new regime made up of the same people who had run Belfast before 1920 would carry on the same policies, except now they would have the full power of a semi-sovereign government uh, to do it with. In the same week as the King opened Parliament, Northern Ireland notables were pictured at Lord Londonderry's garden party. But these scenes were deceptive. The Northern Ireland state faced the implacable hostility of the South. 25% of its population were out of work, and violent confrontations between Protestants and Catholics threatened civil war. These Unionist politicians, who were to preside over Northern Ireland for 50 years, faced the problem that a substantial proportion of the population objected to the new state's very existence. One phase of the Irish Troubles had left, as its legacy, the roots of another. Protestants rejoiced in their new position in a united kingdom. As well as the new Belfast Assembly, the people of Northern Ireland had elected their local government. The constitution protected the Catholic minority with proportional representation, an electoral system that assured minorities of representation in proportion to their size. In the border areas around Belik, the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, was fighting an effective guerrilla war. Raids, shootings and kidnapping were almost daily occurrences. In these same areas, nationalist Catholic councils had been elected and had promptly refused to accept the legitimacy of the Belfast government. In the areas with a Catholic majority, shown here in green, there were nationalist councils. Nearly a third of the province's local government was giving allegiance to the southern parliament. So civil disobedience and guerrilla war threatened to make the state ungovernable. The reaction of the Protestants to the, the rebel councils in 1921-22 was one of fear, I believe, that if the rebel councils that existed in, at that time, who were openly defying central government, who openly stated that their allegiance was to the Parliament of the South and not to the new Parliament of the North, 
then the, the central government and Protestants themselves felt that these people would have to be controlled. That if they got away with what they were attempting to, or doing or attempting to do, that they would destroy the state itself. When the new state was set up, it was set up against the wishes of the majority of the Irish people, including those who controlled these councils, the nationalists who controlled these councils. Uh, they saw no reason to accept the new state. The justification given for setting up the new state was that this was uh, the wish of the people in, in the northeast of Ireland. But if that was to be the case, if you were to take uh, self-determination in, in limited areas, well, then the people in Tyrone and Fermanagh and in Derry City said they, by a majority, wished to be included in an all-Ireland state. So why should they be brought under this new state? So with nationalist councils like Londonderry declaring allegiance to the south, the situation in the province grew tense. Earlier rioting in Derry left 18 people dead. 1,500 troops were needed to keep peace in a town of 40,000. One soldier for every 27 people. With the Protestants besieged and Catholics aggrieved, there was sectarian violence throughout the province. The worst in Belfast, where a protracted campaign of terror was unleashed on the Catholic community, remembered to this day. You'd be lying in bed as a kid at night and hear uh, a lorry suddenly coming along the street and next thing you hear pounding on the door and uh, footsteps inside and hoarse voices and people been trailed out, probably arrested. You didn't know whether they'd been arrested or whether they'd been taken away to be shot by uh, a body that was known as the murder gang at that time. If someone uh, had been taken by the police or if someone was murdered, well, there would be what we say in Irish, uh, the keening, the women crying, you may have heard the expression, and then we, if we heard the keening, then we knew that someone had been murdered by the forces. And I trailed them out of bed, and they shared it down for their mother to come up the stairs, and she went up. And they shot them five sons out of cold blood right along, one by one, in the power and all. Shot them dead and wanted her to witness. In fact, in the morning paper, your parents would read out some item that somebody had been found in the fields with their hands tied with rosary beads or a little sign hung around their heads, a spy or something like that. In fact, my own teacher at St. Paul's School, I remember one weekend uh, on my way to Mass, hearing that he, in fact, had been murdered uh, that weekend. He used to come down our street every morning, 7 o'clock, whistling with the ladders. So everybody missed Malachi this morning, there was no post. And the next thing we got the paper, Malachi half penny. My God, such a death to give that boy. May God forgive the harm they done it. They cut the privates out of him. They tied him to the tree. And then they shot him after, after he'd done his sufferings. Between July 1920 and July 1922, 453 people were killed in Belfast, nearly two-thirds of them Catholic. Hundreds of Catholic families fled their homes. Over 10,000 Catholics lost their jobs, and 500 Catholic businesses were wrecked. It was a pogrom. Clashes had occurred on the same streets, along the same divide between Catholic and Protestant as in the 19th century, and would again later in the 20th century. Undoubtedly, there were attacks from the Catholic side directed towards the Protestant. Uh, but I think that the main reason for the Protestant attacks in the Catholic ghettos was simply because of the fact that most Catholics were seen to be people who gave their allegiance to the Parliament of Southern Ireland and who did not give their allegiance to the new state of Northern Ireland. As well as that, we still had the IRA in existence. Indeed, uh, the IRA at that time were still in control of many of the, the border areas. And therefore the Protestants felt and believed that the best way to deal with the situation was to go into the ghetto areas and root them out. It was a pogrom uh, which was endorsed by the leaders of the Unionist Party who were to become the government of the new state, uh, which was winked at by the police force, if, if not participated in by sections of what was to be the new police force, the special constabulary. They were known to be involved in reprisal killings and so on. And they then, in turn, uh, 
both became the reserve force of the government in successive years, but they also formed most of the, the backbone of the full-time police force. From the beginning, the police force in Northern Ireland was armed and predominantly Protestant. To back them up, a special constabulary was formed, the B Specials, as these part-time police were known. They were also armed and entirely Protestant. By 1922, nearly one in five of the adult male Protestant population was in the B Specials. They were bolstered by the Special Powers Act, which empowered the Minister of Home Affairs to take all such steps and issue all such orders as may be necessary for preserving peace and maintaining order. In other words, he could do anything at all in the name of law and order, be it banning political parties and newspapers, prescribing processions and demonstrations, destroying property, arresting without warrant, or imprisoning without trial. The reason why we had this repressive legislation, which was seen to be against the minority, and undoubtedly that's where it was directed, was against the minority, was quite simply because of the fact that the minority could not be trusted. This, in the minds of the unionists, was the basic problem, that uh, the Catholic population were people who gave their allegiance to a foreign parliament, who were a threat to the state of Northern Ireland, and therefore the unionist politicians and the unionist parliament felt that they had to have powers and machinery to destroy any threat to the state. The effect in the minority community was to create a, a terrible feeling of defeatism, that it was impossible to do anything by political means against the state, that every avenue of change was closed because it could be met, it could be made illegal under the Special Powers Act. And that led in the majority of the population to a heavy feeling of defeatism in a minority uh, it turned them towards violence as the only possible road. If all constitutional activity was illegal, well, there was no resort left but violence. Omar, September 1924. In a nationalist area, Protestant Unionists demonstrated their loyalty to the United Kingdom. But their government had already acted against the rebel councils. Some were suspended. Proportional representation was abolished. And the electoral arrangements juggled so that where there were Catholic majorities, Protestant councils would be returned. Of the 25 nationalist councils of 1921, only two remained by 1925. The Protestant state was secure. Its loyalty is clear. Lord Craig Avon, Prime Minister of Northern Ireland for 20 years. We are part of Great Britain. I think I am right in saying we are the most loyal part of Great Britain. And all Ulster men rejoice in the close relationship between the mother country and ourselves. Throughout the 20s, political life in Ulster was uneventful. Politics were parochial and part-time. As the well-to-do enjoyed themselves on the Antrim coast, it could well have been Eastbourne. But in the slums of Belfast, for both Catholic and Protestant, life grew harder. The world recession of the 30s hit the Belfast working class particularly badly. The conditions were appalling. Women working from six o'clock in the morning to six o'clock at night, and babies born at eight o'clock, and they were back in the job, and between 30 and 40 hours, not able to stand on their feet. I saw children with rickets, deformed children. I subsequently discovered that they were suffering from rickets, malnutrition. And you could, you could hear from many of the little kitchen houses, the boasts and the raucous cough of the consumptive. You see, there was a glut of workers. It's just like having too many uh, uh, strawberries or too many tomatoes. If you have a glut of those, you get them cheap. And there was a glut of workers, human beings, and we were plentiful and we were cheap. It was a difficult time to live in.
Tuberculosis was rife in the linen mills of Belfast. A survey revealed that a third of the working class population had too little to maintain their health and ability to work. In housing, health and sanitation, there had been no progress. Belfast's great industry, shipbuilding, was running down. In 1931, Harland and Wolfe launched its last ship for two years. In 1934, Workman Clarks closed down permanently. One man in four was out of work. Those who'd been out of work for a long time could not claim unemployment benefits. They were forced back on the Victorian poor law. A family with two children got 16 shillings a week, at today's price is about 14 pounds. Four percent of the working population were dependent on the poor law. So this produced a real indignant atmosphere among the workers and we had these uh, meetings and um, eventually uh, hunger marches we had them coming from Derry and I saw one of these hunger marches arriving in North Street one night and they were looked like scarecrows you know it was really a terrible situation some of them were on their bare feet some of them just had a piece of cloth rolled around their feet and blisters probably I'm sure the good Lord had a sore heart when he looked down and saw how we were being treated. But it was a step in the right direction. The falls and the shankle united. We had the drafting into the city of all of the police in Northern Ireland. And we had the armoured cars on the streets. And we had... Uh, it, it was just like an armed camp, you know, the whole of the city. And then martial law was declared. Uh, where three people were gathered together, they could be arrested. And on October 11th, the people decided to defy this and uh, rioting broke out. The riots of 1932, directed against the poor law guardians, brought movie tone cameras from England. Anticipating that there might be an attempt to defy the proclamation, reinforcements of police were drafted in from outlying districts to prevent any large assembly of demonstrators approaching the city buildings where the guardians were in session. Despite the emergency measures, however, several processions formed and the police found themselves forced to use first their batons and finally their firearms to repel the rioters who were using any missile which came to hand. We reached uh, really the heart of the shankle at Agnes Street uh, when a, an old lady in a shawl, they all wore shawls in those days, came running up and she was in a terrible wail mood and she shouted, they're kicking the shit out of the peelers up the falls. Are you going to let them down? And of course, the, that really set the whole thing alight. They uh, got together, both sections of the community, both Protestants and Catholics, and they went on the rampage. They wrecked, they sat back as carts and took the stuff and gave them to the people. Windows were bashed in and it was absolute chaos. Fire engines, places set on fire, and then the police arrived with rifles in an armoured car. And uh, I saw them pursuing these rioters along Agnes Street, and I was amazed when I saw some of these men turning and stopping in their doorways and producing revolvers and firing at the police. The riots had taken the classical Belfast pattern. Shops were looted and barricades set up. Cobbles were prized from the streets and thrown at the police but the poor law rates were doubled. As the police patrolled the now quiet streets, the Catholic Church attacked the riots as communist inspired. The unionist government put it down to Republican agitation. And what happened was that the, the unionist politicians very quickly moved into the Protestant ghetto areas and manipulated the situation again into a constitutional uh, problem, uh, whereby they were saying to the ordinary Protestant working class people, look, you can't unite with these Catholics because uh, what they're doing is only a front, that the real reasons behind the, the, the civil un or the labor unrest was quite simply that they wanted to destroy the state of Northern Ireland and take us into United Ireland. 
And unfortunately, uh, through fear, the Protestant working class believed the stories they were told. And very quickly, the, the whole movement was divided again. And I think that the, the Catholic Church itself uh, must bear some of the brunt of it because they labeled it as a communist front. And so again, you had the, the two extremes manipulating the two working classes uh, into their way of thinking. The Orange Marches of that summer were particularly fervent. A new Republican government in the South was taking a hostile stance towards the North. Unionist politicians responded with speeches appealing to sectarian prejudice. The Prime Minister, Craig Evans, said, It is our duty and privilege to see that we have servants of the most unimpeachable loyalty to King and Constitution in carrying on a Protestant government for a Protestant people. Sir Basil Brooke, later to be Prime Minister, having said he personally did not employ Catholics, went on, Catholics are out to destroy Ulster with all their might and power. They want to nullify the Protestant vote and take all they can out of Ulster and then see it go to hell. And Senator Sir Joseph Davison, Orange Grand Master of Belfast, said, It is our duty to pass the word along from this great demonstration. And I suggest the slogan should be, Protestants employ Protestants. In working class Belfast, seen here in a rare home movie in the summer of 1935, there was now little accord between the two sections of the community. After the summer marches of the Orange Order, rioting broke out. I remember that Sunday as well. They came down in droves and droves and droves. Unfortunately for us, those streets were dug up, the cobbles were dug up, they were about the concrete, and uh, there was plenty of ammunition, and then the war started, there was stones thrown. The first thing they seen a mob at the bottom of the street, and then a few people stopped me and said, your house was trying to burn to the ground, but the, the boys in the district saved it the best they could. There were people burned out in uh, Jenny Moon Street and Nail Water Street, and all down the Dockland area. And his house is burned. Um, bombs thrown, and people killed, and funerals. It went on endlessly. Um, it, it reached such a serious stage that the, the, the government called in the British Army. The British Army uh, came in and took over. And along York Street, in these uh, mixed districts, there was barricades erected. It was almost like a shape of things to come nowadays. Belfast was like a city under martial law, following the worst riots for many years, which left their mark like a scar across the map of Ulster. The trouble arose as a party of Orangemen were returning from Battle of the Boyne celebration. Eleven people had been killed. Catholics were expelled from their jobs, and 500 homes, mostly Catholic, were abandoned. The 1935 rioting had a shattering effect on the Catholic community, I think. They directly blamed the sectarian speeches of, of the government ministers and the prime minister himself in the preceding years for uh, this pogrom against them. And it confirmed for them that they were uh, outsiders in their own country, aliens in their own country. So they felt isolated, vulnerable, and thoroughly demoralized. The rioting had begun in York Street. British troops had been called in to help the police. These streets had witnessed riots in 1886 and the early 20s and would see them again in 1969 and the 1970s. Gradually, the province returned to normal, but the state was still divided, the minority still vulnerable, the majority still besieged. For them, as for Lord Carson before them, there would be no surrender. At his funeral, Protestants remembered the man who led the fight to keep them out of a united Ireland some quarter of a century earlier. The man who had remained unyielding before the idea of a united, independent Ireland. In the cathedral, Lord Carson will lie alone, for until he came, no one was buried there, a symbol of his unique position among Ulstermen. Attitudes had changed little. 
After 20 years, the loyalty of Protestants was undiminished, and soon they would have the opportunity to demonstrate that loyalty again. 1939, European War. Craig Avon put Ulster's position simply. We are King's men. On the 15th of April, 1941, and again in May, Belfast was bombed. I got up onto a high building and it looked to me as if the whole of Belfast was burning. There were fires everywhere you could see. The city was in flames and was a large number of buildings were in ruins through bombs. The German bombers missed all the military targets and hit all the housing around the Antrim Road area. It really was dreadful, dreadful. I can remember our clergyman uh, going around helping to dig the dead out. And one house was 19 people killed. Fearful scenes the following morning as the people leaped on lorries and crowded into trains and fled to Dublin. I was a Protestant and I worked with those girls on the folds making the soup or broth as we call it. People come in for bowls of broth, and nobody asked was the Fenian or a Protestant that made the broth. They were too glad to get it. Over 56,000 houses have been damaged. Nearly a 1,000 people killed. Nineteen forty three, Northern Ireland was an American billet. One hundred and twenty thousand GIs were marshalled in Northern Ireland in preparation for the invasion of Europe. But with the South neutral under Eamon de Valera's leadership, the province was crucial as an aircraft and naval base. Without them, Britain could not keep open her vital Atlantic sea routes. With victory in 1945, it was symbolic the German U-boat should surrender offshore from Londonderry. Churchill reflected afterwards. This was indeed a deadly moment in our life. And if it had not been for the loyalty and friendship of Northern Ireland, we should have been forced to close quarters with Mr. de Valera or perish forever from the earth. 1953. A Viking of the Queen's flight. A loyal Ulster welcome for Elizabeth II on her first visit to Northern Ireland as monarch. <laughs> Dublin had withdrawn the South from the British Commonwealth and declared a republic. But an anxious North had been reassured. Britain, in gratitude for Ulster loyalty in war, had passed the Ireland Act of 1949, guaranteeing that in no event will Northern Ireland, or any part thereof, cease to be part of His Majesty's dominions and of the United Kingdom without the consent of the Parliament of Northern Ireland. This cemented the bond with Britain as powerfully as any Unionist could have wanted. But the country remained deeply divided. Social functions were nearly always segregated and held in halls with religious and political connections. Each community read its own newspapers, kept to its own pubs, doctors, chemists and shops. Catholics played hurling and Gaelic football, Protestants rugby and cricket. The two communities kept to themselves. When they did meet for business, at cattle markets for example, there would be no talk of political or religious matters nor, significantly, of subjects that might lead up to them. But generally, uh, church activities, social activities, uh, each uh, section of the public confined their activities to them. And it's very, very seldom that you'll find, uh, and again, I use these words, a Protestant uh, socializing with, an, uh, say, a Roman Catholic community or a Roman Catholic socializing in a Protestant community. I had quite a number of Protestant friends, which isn't usual, particularly in the cities, uh, for Catholics growing up. 
But there were the occasions like the month of July, I mean, 1st of July, the Union Jacks would go up on the Protestant neighbours' houses. And life changed for that month. The Protestant kids were actively discouraged from playing with us. And their mothers did not, as they did for the rest of the year, congregate in my mother's house for morning tea and chat and gossip. And then once July would be over and the flags would come down, they'd all come sneaking back again. And nobody really passed any remarks. That was uh, the way things were. Tension always mounted in the month of July, when the Orange Order held its traditional marches. They celebrated the victories which had established the Protestant ascendancy in the 17th century. As they passed by or through Catholic districts, they were seen by Catholics as being unnecessarily provocative assertions of superiority. The Orange Order transcended class. Labourer marched with mill owner in defence of their religion and privilege. The Order was committed to instilling the virtues of Protestantism into the minds of its children. Here it had a strange ally, the Roman Catholic Church. Although common schooling perhaps offered the best opportunity for healing the wounds of the past and creating an accommodation between the two communities, it had proved impossible to obtain. The Roman Catholic Church insisted on controlling the education of its own people, despite the loss of state subsidies this entailed. Catholics believe that education is the business of the Church, but in Northern Ireland the Catholic laity had other anxieties. The Catholic lay population opposed integrated education because they feared that state control would lead to the teaching of history, for instance, in state schools being a form of political indoctrination. And they also feared that uh, state-controlled schools uh, would discourage uh, the teaching of Irish, the fostering of Irish uh, cultural interests like Irish music, and Irish dancing and so on, uh, and Gaelic games, which were the, the, the culture uh, of their community. Uh, both the Protestant Church and the Roman Catholic Church saw integration as a threat to their particular brand of religion. And uh, as long as they were in control, of the education, uh, then particularly at primary school level, then they felt that that uh, was safeguard in their position. On the Protestant side, the Orange Order and the Protestant churches were almost as intransigent as the Catholic hierarchy. They insisted on Bible instruction and syllabuses that were, as the Prime Minister Lord Craig Avon had put it, safe for Protestant children. The children of Northern Ireland inhabited two different cultural worlds and attitudes taught at school would be reflected in the ballot box. Unlike Britain, politics in Northern Ireland were not contested between conservative right and Labour left. Here the division was religious, Protestant Unionist, Catholic Nationalist. With two thirds of the population Protestant, a Unionist majority was assured. Catholic politicians in perpetual opposition were largely impotent. In the mid-50s, some Catholics began to vote for the militant Republican Sinn Féin, the political wing of the IRA. It culminated in the election of two Sinn Féin MPs who were, who, who were serving sentences for an arms raid. They were IRA men serving sentences for an arms raid. The election of two of them in 1955 to the Westminster Parliament as a gesture of frustration by the nationalist population. At the same time, the IRA had once again been uh, reviving. Uh, the whole pattern of events has beco had become very cyclical in Northern Ireland. You had a period of constitutional political activity which met with frustration, uh, leading to abstentionism from the parliament, and then a resurgence in support for physical force. The military campaign of the IRA was launched in 1956. Electricity lines were blown up, as this news film of the time shows, while police barracks were attacked and property destroyed. Over four years, there were some 400 incidents. The campaign was largely confined to the countryside, although in Londonderry, a hijacked train was sent 
careering into the railway station. In the whole campaign, 19 people were killed. With little support amongst the Catholic community, it was easily suppressed by strong security measures. Its main achievement was to remind Protestants that they must remain vigilant. Well, regarding the upsurge of IRA activities in the 50s, the Protestant population weren't too concerned about it because we had faced this problem over the years. And every five, ten years, we had a recurrence of IRA activity. Uh, the Protestant population saw it just as a group of anarchists who were out to destroy the state of Northern Ireland, who didn't get much support from the Catholic population. And we were able to sleep quite calmly in our beds at night because we had the B-specials and the RUC to defend us. In Northern Ireland, only one policeman in nine was Catholic. Unlike the police in the rest of the United Kingdom, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, the RUC, was armed. But if the Minister of Home Affairs thought that the situation demanded it, the police could be augmented by a voluntary part-time force, entirely Protestant, the B-Specials. Arms were not issued as the occasion warranted. Once handed out, were kept at home. The specials were regularly used, one of the key weapons in the armory of the Northern Ireland state. I decided to join the B specials in, that was the 56 campaign, the trouble that we had that time. And that trouble mainly came, the, the, the bombers and gunmen in those days came mainly from across the border. And uh, I was an ex-service man who had given quite a few years service to the British Army. And I thought I could help out in those days because uh, there were some very ruthless attacks being made on people around our area. And I thought it was the right and proper thing to do. The beast specials did keep things quiet because the other side of the house, their own colleagues, were frightened of us. In their own way, they were frightened. We had guns. They had nothing. I felt that this was a strong political weapon. Uh, they were a local force. They knew the local people. They knew local conditions. And because of their local knowledge, they were a great asset to the defence of the country. And of course, this did not please some people. Without question, the B-Specials were a partisan force. They were resented and feared by the Catholic population, who were convinced that in the 20s and 30s riots, a special constabulary had supported loyalist attacks and had even been guilty of sectarian murder. Oh, God, hatred. Hatred. Hatred in our hearts. I know I have that hatred in my heart for me. And for the RUC. I could never, never forget what they did, do you know? They were up. Gang of thugs. They weren't uh, a police force at all, you know, corner boys. It was one way of getting them into uh, getting them guns and letting them on the loose. Oh, there's no doubt about that. The beast passes, they were confined practically to the one religion because they were ignored by the, by the Roman Catholic population. And they became a sectarian force, which was not for the good of any country. A new parliament building had been opened at Stormont in 1932. The Unionist Party had, by the 60s, held power for 40 years. No Catholic had held ministerial office. The civil service, which served these politicians, was almost entirely Protestant too. Of 500 important civil servants, only 36 were Catholic. The only successful piece of legislation to originate from the Catholic Nationalist Party was the Wild Birds Act of 1931. And discrimination went beyond government. As the Cameron Report was to show, discrimination against Catholics was widespread throughout Northern Ireland society. Catholics did contribute to the situation they found themselves in, quite simply because of the fact they refused to recognise the state, participate in the state, and therefore refused to take jobs in the civil service. That was one area. And then we had their attitude uh, towards education, in which the educational system that appertained within the Catholic community was orientated more towards the arts and languages, whereas in the Protestant state schools, it was orientated towards engineering and banking and commerce. Therefore, the Protestant children were more able to compete 
the jobs that were coming on the market. Discrimination had become a way of life by the 1960s. 40 years of the northern state had entrenched it so that in certain areas like local government, uh, under some of the councils, virtually no Catholics were employed or there were grades of posts for which no Catholics need apply. Uh, this had ludicrous examples, like in County Fermanagh, where a majority of the population was Catholic. For the job of school bus driver, which required no great skill, there were something like 75 school bus drivers, of whom only seven were Catholics. This film looked at housing in Fintana, County Tyrone, in 1953. Of the town's 314 houses, about a quarter were like these, old, without basic amenities, and mostly inhabited by Catholics. Most of these little houses hold big families. Here are Mrs. Quinn and three of her children outside their cottage in Back Lane. There are six in the family all living here. Mr. Campbell of Mill Street and some of his children. Eight people live here. There's a family of eight here too. This is Mrs. McGuigan, Castle Street with five of her children. Mrs. Pearson, Water Lane with five of her children. Again, a family of eight. Mrs. Mullen of Mill Street has eight children all living here. Big families and little houses are normal in these back streets of Fintana. Forty-eight council houses had been built recently in Fintana, some at Craigavon Park, but only a quarter had gone to Catholics who made up two-thirds of the population. It was common for small Protestant families from sound homes to get council houses. For example, number 5, Craig Avon Park, is occupied only by Mr. Gillespie and his wife. Number 12, only by Mrs. Weir and her daughter. Mrs. Adams lives alone in number 9, and Mrs. Jones alone in number 10. Miss Mills lives alone in number 7. Mr. Gibson and his wife live alone at 24, Mitchellburn Terrace. Mr. Coulter and his wife at number 7. Mr. Holsworth and his sister at number 1. Most of these people already had quite comfortable homes when the council houses were allotted to them. Mr. Holsworth, for instance, sold this farm at Kilgort, near Fintana, before moving to his new house. This bungalow at Coney Warren, ten miles from Fintana, is also a council house controlled by the Oma Rural District Council. Mrs. Jones left it for 10 Craig Avon Park, where she lives alone. Such injustices could not have happened in the rest of the United Kingdom. Local authorities there allocated houses on a point system. People were placed on the waiting list according to the size of their family and the condition of their house. In Northern Ireland, it was at the discretion of local councillors. I would be very foolish to deny that certainly discrimination did take place. But I think it must be pointed out that discrimination went on in both camps. Protestants against Catholics and Catholics against Protestants. And I think it must be accepted that politicians, to exist and continue in power, will always uh, discriminate against the other side. Uh, to keep their own side happy, uh, to get the votes, to keep them in the position that they're in. Local councillors were not elected on the same basis as their counterparts in Britain. Over a quarter of the population had no vote in local elections, and most people who owned factories, offices and shops had more than one vote. But this was not the only eccentricity in Northern Ireland local government. Many local authorities, like Derry, with Catholic majorities, had unionist councils. The device that ensured control by the minority was known as gerrymandering and involved drawing up the electoral boundaries in such a way as to favour one side. The Waterside Ward had 3,500 Protestant voters and 1,800 Catholic. It elected four unionist councillors. In the North Ward, 4,000 Protestant votes defeated 2,500 Catholic votes to return eight Unionists. In the South Ward, 10,000 Catholic votes, as against 1,100 Protestant votes, returned eight Catholic Nationalist councillors. So in all, 12 Unionists and eight Nationalist councillors were returned to sit in Derry's Guild Hall. The Unionists controlled the council. 8,800 Protestant votes returned 12 councillors. 14,500 Catholic votes returned 8 councillors. Derry was not unique. Around the old walled city of Derry, a Catholic vote was, in effect, 
worth less than half a Protestant vote. Londonderry was a symbol of Protestant fortitude. Behind these walls, the Protestants in 1689 had heroically resisted the siege of the Catholic King James II. But for Catholics, Derry was a symbol of all that was unjust in the Northern Ireland state. The very stones in Derry oozed discrimination. The city's geographical location symbolized discrimination because Derry was a plantation city. The old walls of the plantation town were still intact. They were still on top of a hill. They looked down upon the vast, sprawling ghetto of the Bogside. And so to the Catholic population of Derry, living in places like the Bogside, they looked up and saw the Protestant city on a hill dominating them, dominating them in the 1960s as it had done in the 1690s. If the Unionists were to retain control of the city, it was impossible to rehouse Catholics in the Bogside outside the Catholic ward since it would upset the delicate electoral balance. The Cameron report said, council housing policy has been distorted for political ends in unionist controlled areas. The people from these slums in the bog side had to be rehoused in the Cregan council estate within the ward. But that only consolidated the Catholic ghetto. Derry was the most depressed city in the United Kingdom. Here in the 60s, Unemployment among men was as high as one in five. There was also discrimination at work. An analysis based on the 1961 and 71 censuses found the average Protestant to be a skilled manual worker, the average Catholic an unskilled manual worker. In shipbuilding, 90% of the workforce was Protestant. In engineering, 85%, and the Cameron report found clear evidence of discrimination by local authorities. And those not drawing a wage, the unemployed, were twice as likely to be Catholic. In a whole lot of areas of private employment, particularly in the shipyards and the skilled engineering industry and so on, hardly any Catholics were employed. With the result, with, with, with important effects on the structure of the Catholic population, so that by the beginning of the 1970s, surveys have discovered that the Catholic community had become one with a very small professional middle class, uh, a very, very small skilled sector, and a very large sector of unskilled, semi skilled, unskilled, and also unemployed. This growing unskilled Catholic working class was excluded from political life and the social satisfaction of work. From this strata of society would come those who would first throw the stone, then the petrol bomb, and finally take up the gun. But in the 1960s, these injustices, the siege mentality that sustained them, and the sense of grievance they were nurturing, were acknowledged by few in Northern Ireland and even fewer in Britain. For the moment, the back streets of Belfast were only filmed by amateur photographers. <laughs> Critically on Northern Ireland affairs in the 60s, and there was little investigatory journalism Broadcasters were encouraged to leave reporting to the locals who, it was said, best understood the region and its particular difficulties. There was an emphasis on the common ground between the two communities rather than the differences. But in 1959, Alan Wicker reported for the BBC programme tonight about Northern Ireland. Only the first report on betting shots was broadcast. But sufficient... Uh was the degree of uh, pressure exercised by the Stormont regime and by public opinion that the rest of the series was banned. And for, uh, that was in 59, and for um, many years afterwards, something like uh, six or seven, uh, there were no investigative reports made of what was going on in Northern Ireland at all. This week, 7th of July, 1966, 
As far as can be established, this week was the only national current affairs program that reported on political affairs in Northern Ireland before 1968. I know the word of God has many enemies. Church of Rome has burned it and banned it. The modernists have penknifed it. But praise God, the old book still stands. And it'll stand forevermore. The voice of the Reverend Ian Paisley rings out in Ulster, and many listen. To his audiences, he is Martin Luther come again, the true defender of the true Protestant faith. To opponents, he is a strutting turkey cock in the animal farm of Irish politics. This report on Ian Paisley emphasizes religious rather than political appeal. It contained extracts from Paisley's speeches, who at that time was regarded as an inflammatory orator. As a result, this film was thought to be too provocative to be shown in Northern Ireland. I can only, in my own tracing of the records, discover that on one or two occasions was it ever suggested that the minority population suffered discrimination. In fact, I would say that the uh, account given of Northern Ireland society in the Cameron Report, which followed the immediate outbreak of uh, the Troubles, was such that as to reveal to the total population elements of a situation which was unknown to many of them. The media was not alone. By the convention of some 40 years, Westminster rarely discussed the province's internal affairs. Yet Parliament had the final authority and responsibility for Northern Ireland. It was almost impossible to raise about nine-tenths of the issues the reason being that the Government of Ireland Act had devolved responsibility upon the Government of Ireland and uh, in any of those areas one just could not raise the issue without the Speaker ruling you out of order. And Westminster preferred to let sleeping dogs lie, but sleeping dogs never lie forever. And a whole new generation of young people, uh, educated people, people who were not going to tolerate this situation were growing up and uh, Westminster just did nothing about it. In 1968 and 1969, the civil rights movement took to the streets. It consisted mainly of concerned liberals and students. Many of the students were working class Catholics who had emerged from a new and more egalitarian educational system. The frustrations of 40 years were being expressed on the streets. They demanded reform of the electoral system, a fairer distribution of welfare, jobs and housing. There was a united force of the people marching together uh, in opposition to the lack of democratic rights in Northern Ireland. The government had got away <laughs> for 50 years with just blatantly um, operating the policy of gerrymandering, which was particularly obvious in somewhere like Derry. And they didn't even bother to go to the trouble to hide it. It was quite blatant. And suddenly people said, we've had enough, we're going to protest. These people had tried all the you know, democratic channels, the lobbying of MPs, and had got nowhere. And therefore, as a last resort, they had opted for uh, public demonstrations. I wanted to march and protest. Uh, I wanted to sit down in the street. I wanted to tell as many people as I could. But the biggest impetus certainly came from the black civil rights movement and a feeling among Catholics that if the blacks of America could take on that mighty nation, we could take on a top and state. Any person her wishes, her parade, or hold a meeting is quite at liberty to do so, provided he holds it other than in an area specified in the... One of the earliest marches had been in Derry, late in 1968. Sorry, we, we welcome you, sir. But civil, civil liberties, I'll be the 
Then get the civil liberties, get Jerry yeah. Fenton and the rest of the men who's yeah. organized. Here, here. Uh-huh. Ladies and gentlemen, I would certainly hope that in conducting this march in our city, that we will act in a responsible manner, demonstrating to the authorities that our intentions are to secure civil rights for the people of our city and not to cause strife or bloodshed in our city. It was these pictures that brought the Northern Ireland question back into the headlines. But some Protestants saw civil rights as a threat to their way of life, as veiled republicanism. I felt it was just one of these periodical upsurges. It definitely was anti-government. It definitely was anti-British. They were shouting about the uh, inhumanities that were being done to the Catholics and something. This was happening to the Catholics. The Catholics couldn't get jobs. The Catholics couldn't get uh, houses. But in the same token, I was a Protestant, and I couldn't get these things. The whole community was reacting, almost as one person, to what we regarded as a very, very serious threat towards our way of life. They just emphasised Catholic everything. I think that's what happened mainly to the Protestants as well when they saw this, most of the Protestants, that it was not a movement for civil rights, it was a movement for civil rights for Catholics and everybody else. Last night, the local committee on your behalf, made a decision. <laughs> that decision was that they would not accept any reroute on this march. The situation began to escalate after a series of civil rights marches had been attacked by Protestant vigilantes and further worsened after police had damaged property as they harassed and taunted residents in the Catholic bog site of Derry on two occasions in early 1969. <laughs> Difficult though it may be to say it, but we must say it, that it is impossible to go through the police barricades. At a march in Newry, the demonstrators turned violent. But in Derry, seven months later, August 1969, the situation had further degenerated. CS gas was used for the first time in the United Kingdom. She shouldn't rubberize. Don't give her anything to drink and rubberize with a drying cloth. Put Vaseline on it. Was that more gas? It was answered by petrol bombs thrown by Catholic youths from the Rossville Flats. <laughs> Catholics in the bog side held the police at bay for three days and three nights. On the third night, serious disorder broke out across the rest of the province. Northern Ireland stood on the precipice of civil war. In Belfast, the situation was particularly serious. 
The presence of the B specials inflamed the Catholics. The police failed to control Protestant mobs and prevent arson and looting. Eight people were killed and hundreds injured. Some Catholic streets were virtually burnt to the ground. The early morning saw Catholics abandoning their homes. Catholics reflected. I would say that I don't think actually the IRA went on the offensive, that the people went on the offensive. You know, it was the people who had enough at that time. They were brought out into the open, they were brought onto the streets because of the intimidation, the burnings, um, the people came onto the streets. They are out. Well, they are also, but everybody, literally everybody, in a nationalist or, or Catholic gather, call it what you will, came onto the streets because they knew at some stage their house or their home they would be affected. And if one grew from the other, or one gave support to the other, then it was inevitable. Sixty-nine was was horrific. Because of the burnings out, because of the, the turmoil that, that, that took place in the ghettos, it committed everyone to either de <laughs> defence or attack, but it committed people to be counted. The realisation that the nationalist people were under attack, and there was nobody to defend them. I was a member of the nationalist community at that time. Okay, I was only 15 and a half, but I knew that I knew what I had to do, and I did it. And I joined the struggle from then on. When 69 occurred, my father, who had never, and I, I think this is a conscious decision on his part, never talked about, about the IRA or talked about armed resistance or glorified in past IRA campaigns, started to equate developments and started to talk freely for the first time about uh, comparisons between what we were going through in Rat and that had taken place in the 30s <clears throat> and in the 20s. I'll never forget the first time I've seen somebody walking down the street with a rifle. And this was in Cumber Street, and taken up position to return fire. Um, and these were just ordinary blokes that lived in the area, and they were taken up arms to defend it. To avert civil war in the province and the possibility of a pogrom against Catholics in Belfast, the British government had been forced to send in the British army. With the army now on the streets, the British government would have to concern itself more directly with the politics of Northern Ireland. But interest and intervention had come too late. Events now had a relentless logic of their own. In the ghettos of scarred and gutted streets that the army now patrolled, the IRA had begun to reorganize. The prospect of armed Republicans produced an inevitable reaction amongst militant Protestants. You felt the whole tension, the whole, all over the Holy Ulster, where you lived and all, you know what I mean? There was a very thing atmosphere, cold atmosphere and everything. And then you start to realise, well, something's happened here now, like, because they're not just throwing stones and all now, they're using guns. I know it's, it's hard for a Protestant to say, but I think it was really a Protestant's that brought forward the upsurge of the provost at that time by the actions it took. I don't disagree with the actions because it was the only thing we could do in those days. There was nothing else we could do. We would ever just sit back and let the civil rights trample us down. And uh, I, for one, was never wrong to do that. I felt that uh, what I had been brought up to believe and was being taken away from me, what my parents had worked hard for to build up a home and a decent family, was all suddenly going to be taken off them. It took them 30 years to build our home and family up. And somebody was just going to come in and take it off them. Well, I said to myself, this is not. We knew something like this was going to happen. Not to the scale it did happen, but it was going to come out. And uh, we expected it. But it hardened the case in my part to really then um, fight fire with fire. And the only way then to get rid of civil rights, the IRA, the lot, was to wipe them off the face of the earth. And this was a basic attitude 
Van Allen had to start. Protestants from Spring Martin Estate formed up 300 yards away across waste ground behind Union Jacks. The tension increased. Troops were moved up further along the road towards the Catholic crowd. A man who tried to make a lone dash towards the Protestants was hauled back by friends. The present phase of the Troubles, the longest in Ireland's history, had begun. After an earlier confrontation down the end, which looked at the time like the kind of civil rights clash we knew from years ago. A few minutes later, the first exploded. The army have said throughout the day that they hope to use minimum force. But three hours after the procession began, this has ended up as dust comes onto the box side. It's the worst ever confrontation Twice before, the army has successfully defused bombs. But today, the terrorists managed to hit a primary target. First among the causes, the commission puts the growing sense of injustice and grievance among Catholics over inadequate housing of them and their allocation of houses by some local authorities. Other points cover complaints of anti-Catholic discrimination in local government appointments, resentment at the continuance of the Special Powers Act, and the existence of the B-Specials as a partisan force. Thank you.